Welcome to the third and final section of our conversation on Children of Legends. It's a treat, as always, to welcome back Rachel Sharansky Danziger. Thank welcome you, Rachel. back, Rachel. Thank you. We began talking about Yitzchak, talking about how Avraham bequeathed to Yitzchak a sense of mission. Last time we talked about King Saul, Shaul, how he, in a sense, bequeathed to his children a feeling or a need for loyalty and how his children dealt with that. As we look today at the children of King David, of David HaMelech, we really look at something else. It's not what David bequeathed to them, but rather it's what is it like growing up in the house of a legend? What's it like growing up with that sense of entitlement, that sense of luxury that you can only find if you grow up in the house of a legend? And I want to look together with you today at how that plays itself out with the children of David. Tragically, <laughs> to put it succinctly. Um, I think that the first case that comes to mind, and in fact, the first story in the series of stories in the second part of Shmuel Bet, of the second book of Samuel, that focuses on David's children, is the story of Amnon. Amnon is a boy who grew up in the court, who grew up with power, who grew up um, with privileges, and he rises to our expectation by being an entitled, spoiled brat. Amnon desires his sister Tamar, he wants her, he finds a way to get her alone with him. In fact, he manipulates his father into helping him arrange that. He pretends to be sick and asks his father, King David, to send his daughter Tamar to uh, cook for Amnon and comfort him in his, uh, on his sick bed. And then when he's alone with her, he demands um, that she will submit to his desire, and when she tries to Resist, he rages her. When he's done with what he wants to do, he has no love for her. In fact, he hates her more than he loved her, as, they say, as the story says. He hates her then more than he loved her at first. We might argue the word love in that context, but that's what it says in the text. Um, and throws her out without any regard to her sense of shame, without any regard to her sense of... Um, being exposed as a woman raped will ruin her. He just throws her out. He shows no uh, sense of responsibility for what happens to her and what her life is going to be like. If this isn't a classic textbook example of what happens when you raise a child um, with a sense of entitlement, I don't know what is. And perhaps Biblical storyteller is drawing our attention to this fact and to David's complicity, in a sense, in the situation when at the end of this story, we're told um, that David was angry. And this wording, and David was angry, by Chal David Me'od, is a, is a phrase that usually in the biblical story is followed by action or speech. Usually we don't see emotions standing alone. Yet that's exactly what we see here. We see a very short verse that says that he was angry, that he heard about it and he was angry, and we expect to see something happen, and there's nothing. There's a silence. And this is a toxic, dangerous silence. This is the silence of bystanders throughout history here in the house of our beloved King David. And it's um, a warning for us as parents it's a question mark. A lot of commentators are trying to understand why is David silence? Why is David, who's a man who was renowned for taking initiative and taking things into his own hand, not responding? One possible explanation is that this story follows hot on the heels of David's own indiscretion in taking the wife of another man, Bathsheba. And then when Bathsheba became pregnant, trying at first to arrange that the baby will pass off as that man's, Uriah's son, and then when that didn't work out, getting Uriah killed in battle, arranging for his death and taking Bacheva as his own wife. So maybe David felt that he set such a bad example that he has no standing, no, um, you know, that he doesn't have the moral authority 
to remonstrate with Amnon? I don't know. But it demonstrates, it illustrates the vacuum that allows certain children of certain legends um, to abuse their position. So that's, of course, you know, that's such an important point. And this is a point that we didn't see in the children of legend that we studied earlier. But I think the last point you make, the fact that David doesn't act on his anger and that maybe he feels that he doesn't have the moral authority to do it because he sinned the same way with Bathsheba. And, you know, sometimes you're reminded of things when it plays itself out with your children. That's true about legends and, non, and not legends. That's the way um, the human mind works. I think that raises another interesting piece. And that's the question of, you know, children of legends, by living, by growing up with the legends, they have an intimate knowledge understanding of the legend. They see things that other people don't see. Sometimes that means that they see that the legend is even greater than we, we the, you know, the, 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 you know, the people who read the newspaper, greater even than we think the legend is. But more often than not, when you grow up with a legend and you know that legend intimately, you recognize that that legend has flaws. And you wonder, I'm known, in a sense, he's spoiled. Not in a sense, he's spoiled. How much does that have to do with the fact that he saw flaws in his father? He grows up in the lap of luxury, but at the same time, he's conflicted because he knows that his father is not as, as perfect as everybody else thinks that he is. And I wonder how that reflects itself specifically in the stories that, as you said, the tragic stories of Abshalom. So, the, the story of Abshalom, which is a story that then, kind of after the Amnon rape story takes place, the story of Shalom is the one that um, starts building up and carries through most of the rest of the book, is very much rooted exactly in David's silence. If David's relationship with Bathsheba had some influence on Amnon and his own uh, promiscuity is conjecture. That David's silence um, motivated Avshalom's descent from beloved prince and son to eventually rebel and a dead rebel at that against his own father. Uh, I think is unquestionable. It's obvious from the text because what happens, I, I mentioned before that there's this very short verse where David is angry but doesn't say anything. This verse is wrapped, it's in scone within two verses that talk about Avshalom's response to the rape of his sister Tamar. They shared a mother, not just a father, unlike Amnon and Tamar. And at first he is angry on her behalf. He talks to her. He tells her, come to my house. He takes her in. Then David is angry and doesn't do anything. And then again, Avshalom um, is angry and doesn't speak to Amnon at all for two years. But in his case, the silence is not um, an avoidance of remonstration, but rather preparation for something harsher. Because what Avshalom does next is he invites all the, the king's sons to a party and kills Amnon in revenge. In other words, when Avshalom sees that his father fails to take responsibility and handle the situation and discipline his own son Amnon, Avshalom takes it into his own hand. Now, if the story would have ended here, it would have been a tragic, sad, terrible story, rape, fratricide, incest, all kinds of horrible things, um, but it wouldn't have been as definitive a tragedy in David's life. But what happens next is that David continues to show the same lack of initiative in his responses. Avshalom murders Amnon and runs away. David does nothing. Until his general, Yoav, seeing that David misses Avshalom, orchestrates a whole campaign to push the king into inviting Avshalom back from exile. But even then, David doesn't actually invite him back to court. He just lets him come back to the country. Then Avshalom orchestrates a whole campaign to push other people, to push the king, to invite him back into the court. And David 
accepts it. He surrenders to this pressure and invites David back in, but he shows him no warmth. And the way the biblical storyteller portrays it is very, very exact. It says that the king kissed Avshalom. It doesn't say David or Avshalom's father. The king kissed Avshalom. You know, the persona, the external um, hallow, the legend kissed Avshalom. But where is the father? And it's there at this moment that Avshalom starts his campaign to undermine David, a campaign that eventually leads him to arouse a, a, raise an army and uh, go into a wholesale rebellion against his father. So what we really have is, and I think that's interesting to kind of move from Amnon to Avshalom, because really it's what Avshalom sees in the story with um, Amnon and Tamar, and the way that his father did or didn't react, that leaves that leads eventually Avshalom to rebel against his father. And I think this intrigue, and I think here the word intrigue is really the right word. The word the word the intrigue really comes from growing up in the house of the legend, of knowing the legend, of interacting with other children of the legends. You know, we talked before about growing up in the lap of luxury. But you know, one of the challenges of growing up in the lap of luxury is that there were a lot of children and they all grew up in the lap of luxury. And how does each one deal with the other one? And the fact that they shared a father, but some of them didn't share a mother and how that played itself out. So I would say, as we conclude this conversation and we look back on these three conversations about children of legends, mm -hmm. we began, you began the first conversation by talking about the fact that we're prone just because that's just the way people are to think about legends. And that's important and we should continue to study the legends, no question about it. But I think what we've seen in these conversations is that the lessons, the lessons as they relate to the stories in Tanakh and the lessons as they relate throughout history, the lessons are not only in how to be a legend, but the lessons are also in how to be children of legends. Whether it's in how to deal with the mission of that legend, how to deal with the loyalty that's required, and how to deal with what it's like to grow up in the house of a legend. And I'll let you just have the last word here as we kind of wrap up this conversation. So I just wanted to say that um, if we look back at our conversations here, we started with Itzhak and with the concept of responsibility, with the concept of Itzhak's responsibility to preserve his father's achievements, to continue his father's mission. And the truth is that that in our description of Avshalom, we talked a lot about the Vid's failure, but Avshalom fails too. You know, a father, a legendary father, has a responsibility to raise kids um, who are not as entitled as Amnon or as neglected, in a sense, as Avshalom. But also the children of legend have a responsibility. They, they have something they have to do as well. And what we see in Avshalom is that in his anger at the failings of his father, at the neglect, at the silence that his father deals uh, to him, to Tamal, to the tragic events in his household. Avshalom tries to grab power. He rapes his father's concubines. He tries to kill his father. He tries to take power from his father without really understanding what power is all about, without really um, understanding that power comes with a certain responsibility without um, nurturing relationships with his supporters that have to do with uh, fighting for something greater than themselves together like David did and that's really what helped him win that uh, stand down between his army and Absalom's army the people that was with, were with him the loyalties the experiences behind his brain Absalom didn't try for any of that Absalom was just um, trying for cheap demagogic trick for rhetoric uh, for quick support, for paid mercenaries, um, for anything that will get gratify his vanity and sense of uh, entitlement and revenge. And perhaps here lies uh, one lesson for all of us. 
we are children of legends, all of us, in the mere fact, through the mere fact that we're following the tradition of Abraham and David and all our great uh, luminaries and role models from the Bible onwards. So it behooves us to treat that role, that fact, with responsibility and not to try to imitate merely the external trappings of grandeur or glory or power that are parents and grandparents and great parents and biblical great parents um, bequeathed us, but also learn what, were, what was it inside them? What was it in their behavior? What was it in their souls that gave them power, that gave them glory, that gave them all those things we want and emulate that? And perhaps this is uh, what it means to be a worthy child of legend. Thank you so much, Rachel. You leave us with a challenge, and that, I think, is a, is, is a, is a, is a worthwhile challenge for each and every one of us. Thank you always for um, listening to our 929 9 English podcast. Thank you, Rachel. It's always a treat to be able to try to unearth and to, um, you know, to really analyze these fascinating, fascinating topics in Tanakh. And we very much are looking forward to the next ones. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you.